So here um, is the NAU um, land acknowledgement, which reads Northern Arizona University sits at the base of the San Francisco peaks in the homeland sacred to Native Americans throughout this region. We honor their past, present, and future generations who have lived here for millennia and will forever call this place home. And in respect to other tribal nations that are joining us at this gathering, I also want to acknowledge your homelands and that we uh, continue with this particular webinar in a good way. Again, I thank Mr. Lyle Cook uh, for providing the opening prayer so that we can continue this gathering in a good place. At this time, I would like to introduce Connie Lee Burke, the program director, program director for the Red Lane, Lake Band of Chippewa Indians. Their project is located in Red Lake, Minnesota. I again thank um, Connie for supporting Abertax effort to share stories with other programs as well as with our partners. And with that, uh, Connie, you are um, ready to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lee. Anin Indinawe Maganak, Indota Makwa, Magisi Ikwe Indigena Cars, Indunjaba Red Lake, Indana Anoki Ganu Kaigan. That was a standard protocol greeting in my native language, Ojibwe Moan, and the English translation, hello, my relatives. I am from the Bear Clan. My name is Bald Eagle Woman. I am from Red Lake. I work at Golden Eagle House. My name is Connie Lee Berg, and I am an, an enrolled member of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians. My mother, Loretta Spearsburg, was four fourths, full blood. The Red Lake Nation is situated in the state of Minnesota, USA. The state of hockey, everybody knows that I'm a Minnesota Wild hockey fan, and I have to mention that. We are north of the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Our largest district, which is Red Lake, is about 100 miles south of the US-Canadian border. Our most traditional district is Panema. We also have the Little Rock District, which is my home district. Uh, the Panema District, which is the most traditional district and uh, the district of Red Deep. We are in a remote location. Our tribe's most distinguishable environmental asset is our lake. It is central to our homelands. Our land base equates to being a little larger than the size of the state of Rhode Island. Historically and contemporarily, our lakes provide us with family sustenance, income, ceremony, medicines, healing, the strengths of our own spirituality. Additionally, I would mention tremendous pride and such magnificent beauty. Red Lake Vocational Rehabilitation Services started in 1992. I started in 1992 as Executive One, which was a clerical data entry administrative assistant position. Three years later, I was named director of the program. We served the Red Lake Nation, which consists of the four districts that I mentioned. For two years, I also worked at the uh, Sequan Tribe in Southern California, Sequan Intertribal Vocational Rehab. So I have, an, uh, I'm sorry, I have experience for tribal and urban area vocational rehabilitation services programs. I have great memories of my Sequan employment and maintain friendships with several of the people I, I met while working for Sequan. Um, our tribe, the Red Lake Band, has a priority in tribal language revival. Our chairman, Daryl Seeke, provided our Red Lake Vocational Rehabilitation Services with the name Ganua Kaigan, Golden Eagle House. The 
the golden eagle has powerful medicine. And just as the bald eagle delivers our prayers to Geechee Manadu, the golden eagle delivers our healing prayers. When it became a learning objective for this session to identify challenges in addressing barriers to employment for consumers residing in isolated communities, my initial thought for our area was the extreme cold weather. Red Lake winters are frigid, snowy, windy, and mostly cloudy. The snowy period of the year lasts for 5.8 months. In Red Lake during the entire year, snow falls for 97.9 days and aggregates up to 36.85 inches of snowfall. The topography within 10 miles of Red Lake is covered by 45% trees and 49% water. And I personally believe they should add snow to that list. The information on weather and topography was obtained from weatherspark.com. I find it so ironic that I'm using a computerized system to detail a culturally responsive program. Oh, but we are indeed progressive. We learned much about services needed by having our relatives complete surveys each year. The surveys are analyzed and the information is used in writing future program objectives. From this last survey, we learned that substance abuse and mental health disorders were the primary disabilities of the relatives we surveyed. Diabetes was also high on the list and several with dual or multiple diagnoses. We have responded to each of these three high categories of disabilities held by our people. One of the survey questions, what activities would you like to see added or would you like to see more of? Healing ceremonies, which we do. A number of persons suggested we add shake tent and 11 people provided the response, other traditionally related responses. We learned we had our people going out on the lake to fish without adequate shelter. So I met with two local fishermen, well known to be professionals on the lake. They became my advisors and we developed the ice fishing project. We just recently started the second season of the ice fishing project. It is one of the most successful projects that we have developed. It also provides service to individuals that usually remain underserved, the male adult population with a history of chemical dependency. And to define how to plan, design, and implement culturally responsive tribal VR services, talking to our elders and people with knowledge to help us make the program successful and hearing directly from the relatives that we serve. Hypothermia is an environmental hazard in Minnesota. The most common causes are exposure to cold weather conditions or cold water. The winter gear that we provide for the ice fishing project takes this into consideration. We provide thermal wear, jackets, bib cover hauls with inflation devices where if the person is to become submerged in water because the ice can shift, the inflation devices automatically inflate and bring the person to surface. We provide shelters, propane heaters with hose and tank. This year we've all, we're also providing gloves, caps, masks, boots, and thermal socks. That's to keep our relatives warm. Our advisors also clear a roadway to the ice fishing community on the lake. And the chemical health program has helped with this task as well. The shelters are in close proximity to each other and the advisors and other fishermen look out for each other when they're out on the lake. The fishing gear also includes sleds, sometimes with shelter, sometimes separate, ice fishing rods, bait and tackle, fish finders, which also shows ice depth and water depth, augers, containers to keep lunch warm, and large containers to hold the catch of the day. 
due to the extreme cold last year, we actually started providing additional refills for the propane tanks when it was 35 degrees below zero. Minnesota's record cold temperature is 60 degrees below zero. The many disabilities that we have seen presented, the cold weather definitely can adversely affect their symptomology. So ice fishing is not for everyone. We have to take into consideration the voca vocational ramifications for each of our relatives. Lake ceremonies are held to ask our creator to watch over our people that are on the lake to keep them safe. Post COVID had many not wanting to re-enter community gatherings, workplaces. They wanted to remain home safe or at least away from crowds. The ice fishing project was a great response. We also started a home-based sewing business program for 10 individuals. Many are producing native regalia. We provide the cost for the business license, sewing machine and materials needed to demonstrate their interest. When they show us the completed work of a project that they've made, then we initiate the full amount for establishing inventory, the material needs to begin their home-based business. Also, in collaboration with the American Red Cross, we started training CPR, AED, and first aid to demonstrate a response to the high risk professions, recreational and environmental hazards, and the general health disparities seen by our people. We knew of only one instructor in the tribal communities. We now have 10, including myself. We also received the Karen Tomlin Memorial Award for our work with the American Red Cross. It was the first time an organization in Minnesota received this award. This was for exemplary community service. I'm also certified with the American Heart Association for CPR, AED, and first aid. In response for the critical need for on-site reviving due to the escalating numbers of overdoses, we started working with our IHS pharmacy for training our workforce and communities in Narcan administration. Since this time, I have also became a Narcan instructor. I've trained 128 relatives on the, on the use of Narcan, and I, I have distributed 240 units of Narcan in our tribal communities. We work very well with IHS farms. We have seen a rise in suicides and we've lost members to overdose, COVID, and other complications from COVID. So grief and grieving became a very real concern to our relatives in their efforts to maintain employment. Red Lake people lost many close to them, family, relatives, significant others, friends and coworkers. Grief and grieving became a very real concern. Wanting to learn more about how I could help, I enrolled in the University of Wisconsin-Madison for the Grief Support Specialist Program following the COVID hiatus. I completed the course and hold a certificate as a grief support specialist. We then purchased a pontoon so we can hold support groups out on the lake. The lake has healing powers. It is what helps us most. We also began ceremonies of healing. We hold sweats for men and cedar ceremony for women with our native healers. We give our sacred medicines to those who ask. And the lake ceremony is where we provide materials to make the raft. Completed rafts are released on the shore with an offering and prayers. Following the ceremonies, we provide feast. Because there was such a great demand for healing ceremonies, others in the community started holding healing ceremonies also on a more frequent basis. Many of the men going to sweat started when they were in treatment for chemical dependency. Many of the women going to ceremony often talk about the difficulty and stress they felt from so many people affected by COVID, drugs, suicide, and also being afraid when protective measures for COVID were lifted. Being a closed reservation, 
we literally closed our borders. We had our own border patrol at each entry point of the Red Lake Indian Reservation and only members were allowed access. There were a few exceptions, non-resident law enforcement, emergency medical and educational personnel, food grocery shipments. Our chairman and our tribal council are very proactive in maintaining a safe environment for our people of Red Lake. I have worked with every tribal administration that Red Lake has had. And we see such tremendous support from our tribal leaders. And I certainly appreciate that tremendously. I also want to acknowledge our funding agency, RSA, Department of Education, for their continued support. We cannot do all of this without your support. And from our Red Lake Nation, I express our deepest appreciation. I could not do all of this without the help of my own staff, Karen Graves and Heather Donnell. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Jerry Loud, Executive Director of Oshti Majitata, for all he does for the Red Lake Vocational Rehabilitation Services Program. Also, Tracy Kingbird and Eugene Standing Cloud, Assistant Executive Directors of Oshti Majitata. Eugene is also our elected Panema District Representative for our Tribal Council. Our on-the-job training program provides employment opportunity, opportunities throughout the tribal communities, and our contract, contracting agency is Oshki Majitata. I also thank all of the former recipients of Vocational Rehab that tell people, go see Vocational Rehab, they'll help you. I absolutely love the work that I do. And I wanna thank everybody for hearing about our methodology, incorporating our culture into the program and the very real success in operating a very culturally responsive American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Services Program. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that wealth of information, knowledge, uh, experience in serving your relatives to prepare for gainful employment. Does anyone have any questions uh, for Connie? We have a little bit of time before we move on to the next presenter. No question, but there's a comment in the chat box about uh, from Rachel Allen saying, uh, thank you for sharing about your program, Connie. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, um, why don't we move on uh, to the next presenter? Our next distinguished presenter is Amanda Reyes. Uh, Amanda is the program coordinator, counselor for the Tenana Chief uh, VR program, and they are located in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, good morning, Amanda. Um, you are all set to go, and um, we look forward to hearing your story. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Lee mentioned, I, my name is Amanda Race. And I've lived in Alaska for 36 years consecutively. Uh, I came here at, as an 18 year old. I came back here as an 18 year old. My dad was uh, Navy. Um, so I do appreciate all our veterans out there. Very honored to be the daughter of a veteran and granddaughter and great granddaughter. Um, so I've been at Tanana Chiefs for 24 years uh, in January uh, 2023. Uh, I was fortunate to come here under the guidance of a former uh, Voc Rehab Director, Jackie Bisbee, who's living down there in beautiful Arizona. While we are slightly frozen up here in the interior of Alaska, it is minus 23 degrees this morning. So I made sure to put on my 
winter beaded gloves. Could not function without them. <laughs> Had to plug my vehicle in this morning at work. Uh, so we, our program has been around since 1995. And as Connie mentioned, uh, very thankful to RSA, Rehab Services Administration for that funding. Um, it's, it's, it's been a, a great experience and the, the background, the, the backbone of our program is uh, cultural um, knowledge, wanting to um, continue the ways of um, the people before them here in the interior of Alaska. Our biggest challenges are um, the competitive, the lack of competitive jobs in the in the villages. So, past, present, and future. Um, there's only so much funding to go around in tribal offices. Um, we do have a, a newer grant over the last one and a half to two years for uh, funding sanitation workers in all of our villages. Uh, we still have a lot of youth employment. We have employment and training. We have lots of trainings going on, whether they're in the hubs of the different villages or we bring everyone to Fairbanks for training. But for the most part, um, our consumers in tribal voc rehab uh, remain in their chosen villages and they participate in a subsistence lifestyle. So we have been able to contract with elders and uh, relatives of consumers um, as mentors to carry on that knowledge and pass down that knowledge to the younger generation um, or even folks in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who didn't really think they could do it. But I have some great staff. We have a staff, uh, Philip Albert Jr. from Ruby. He's been with Tanana Chief's Tribal VR for 26 years. Um, he will be at KNAR, and so I want everyone to wish him happy retirement uh, for January 2023. He's going to finally take that plunge, and uh, I hope he's online. He has contributed a great deal to the program with his cultural knowledge. He recently, uh, in the last year, worked with um, the special education uh, agency here in Alaska, and along with several other tribal programs, including Kodiak, Kotzebue, uh, I believe Coeric, and uh, we have 12 now, and I'm putting a link in there. So uh, they contracted with a, a person who then contacted everybody in the state of Alaska, practically, Southeast. Southwest, North, um, East, West, and the interior. So they've created a curriculum for students in transition on traditional skills and uh, winter survival, um, beating, hunting, trapping, fishing, everything that you can think of. Um, so while there may not be um, that many uh, competitive jobs or traditional eight to five jobs in our villages, uh, we do uh, gather most of our successes as um, in the subsistence plans that we create for individuals. So the slide you're seeing is from a, another presentation that we did um, several months back with the help of uh, Tom Cyrus. And uh, so at Tanana Chiefs, we have a guiding principle from uh, our traditional chief, Peter John, who passed in the, in the late 90s. Uh, Chuitzen, it means true love. And we are tasked to provide accessible, trusted, world-class services provided with un unconditional love, compassion, dignity, and respect. And the focus is to hear our consumers. Um, while we survey our consumer, consumers with 
um, asking them, you know, how, if our services were timely, um, I would like to see and take that a step further. I liked Connie's um, idea of surveying consumers what they want more of, um, whether it's traditional healing or um, more self-care activities. But for the most part, we provide all the equipment that you could ever imagine, whether it's winter gear, um, fishing nets, um, chainsaws, uh, winter Arctic tents, um, small cook stove for, for a fish camp or moose camp. Um, we sit down with the clients or consumers um, often, especially at intake, hearing their story, what they've gone through, um, their failures and what they want to be successful at. They want to be self-sufficient. They wanna help their families and they wanna help their communities. So we work, we try to work closely with tribal offices to let them know that we have individuals out there who now have a four wheeler or a snow machine or um, fish nets, the cutting tools, um, sleds, trailers to haul uh, wood and other items to and from the village so that they can participate in um, all the community events as well. Next slide. Um, actually, you can go ahead and skip that slide. Um, I have sent out the PDF link and I can send that out to, again to anyone who um, would like to read. We were all given our um, Chief Peter John, uh, the Gospel According to book, several years ago, and uh, it's a it's a nice read. It's all about his life growing up in the interior of Alaska, and just to give you an idea of the region that Tanana Chief serves, uh, we are the the largest region outlined in the middle of the state. Uh, we have 42 tribes, 37 of those are recognized uh, federally. Uh, again, we've been around since 1995 and I have personally flown to over half of those villages. Um, uh, Philip is from the village of Ruby. It takes anywhere from uh, half an hour to two hours to get to any one village. Sometimes we have to fly to Anchorage on a commercial flight to then get to the Southwest um, area like McGrath or Shagluck, Grayling, Holy Cross. Uh, there are only nine villages that we can drive to from Fairbanks. Uh, we've got Ninana, Dot Lake, Tanacross, Toke, Northway. Um, we can drive north up to Minto and to circle, but then from circle, you could get on the, the river and then go by boat if you wanted to. But most of the places that we have to serve, we fly to. Um, try to spend the night, but if not, um, depending on our funding, uh, we try to provide the majority of our funding to our consumers. And so in the past years, we have uh, uh, limited our travel we also take the time to meet with our consumers when they fly to Fairbanks. Um, they come in to go to Chief Andrew Isaac Clinic, uh, other medical needs, um, even to go shopping in the uh, um, holidays. But for the most part, they are at fish camp in the summers. And so our flying takes place anywhere between uh, March uh, to October. Uh, January, February tend to be anywhere from 20 to below, 20 below to 50 below. Uh, I think our coldest uh, recorded temperature was about 80 below. Um, and that was probably north, um, whether it was in Birch Creek or Chalkitsik, but also in Tok, Alaska, which is on the Alaska Highway um, as you're headed toward Canada. And then Northway, of course, is on the border of uh, Alaska and Canada. So it could take anywhere from an hour to 
to four hours to get to any any one of those villages in our region. Um, we do have 12 tribal voc rehab programs in Alaska now, and uh, those are sort of mapped out um, and outlined in the different areas. Um, we've got a couple offices in Anchorage, Cook Inlet, um, Aleutian Pribilof, and then you have Southeast, Plinkett Haida, Matlakatla. Um, there are some new ones as well. We've got the Inupiat community of Arctic Slope and Coeric and Kotzebue, Bethel. <laughs> so we usually just use a regular individual plan for employment to create the subsistence plan for employment. Um, obviously the goal is, is a little more broad uh, because based on the season, they may do, do different activities. Uh, you have your um, fishing um, all summer, the hunting in the fall, uh, berry picking in the summer, um, pretty much doing bead work all year round for the most part. Um, we also have some baker, a baker in one of our villages. They're um, baking breads and fry bread, other items that are needed in that house food. And a lot of the way we track, um, how we track subsistence is sort of on the honor system. Uh, we do provide uh, blank receipts for anything that is um, sewn. We have the different necklaces and earrings. Uh, I have here some slippers that have been created. Um, so you're, we've created a receipt to document whether they've received cash for their artwork or um, they've bartered, they've traded for fish, fuel, uh, whatever, whatever it might be. A lot of our folks may or may not already be on social security disability benefits. So it's supplementing their income. Uh, if they're doing bigger activities, hunting, fishing, um, hauling wood, uh, we'll have them write up a paragraph of their activities for that 90 day period. Um, we're constantly checking up on them. Uh, we do try to provide fuel on a monthly basis. So you've got your three months of fuel and then most of our, all of our consumers receive post-employment. Uh, could go on to the next slide. That's just a little bit more about Chewitzen and our core values. Um, so we do spend a lot of time during intake, um, hearing their story, uh, gaining their trust. Uh, Philip is from the region, so we, we depend on him quite a bit. He can share his experience. He also has physical disability, and he's sort of a literally a, a walking success story example of what um, not only state voc rehab, but tribal voc rehab. Uh, state voc rehab helped Philip get to where he is, and tribal voc rehab has provided him with um, with a living wage um, throughout the years. And he's been able to share his experience uh, at transition camps for kids with special education needs. Um, he's talked to other consumers that are in the same boat, um, have the same similar disabilities as him. He's been able to share the fact that he also still hunts. Um, and so we just, really look at where that consumer is and, and lift them up. Um, I know a lot of folks have talked about, it's not a hand out, it's a hand up. We're lifting up consumers um, to be more mm -hmm. self-sufficient um, and successful in their communities. You can go ahead and go to the uh, last slide. Next slide. 
So these are uh, the Athabascan uh, values for the interior of Alaska. Um, again, we encourage all of our consumers to seek the advice of their elders, um, uh, identify a mentor, whether that's a relative or a neighbor in their village. Um, they're <laughs> tight knit communities. They know each other. They know their tribal council. They know their uh, first chief and second chief. Uh, the presidents of their corporation. But we just try to instill in the uh, individual plan for employment that um, they're <laughs> self-sufficient, they're working hard, um, they're using the wisdom um, from past experiences, and they're honoring their, their relatives um, by using the different uh, cultural uh, knowledge and their way of life to continue on. And uh, so we have a lot of a lot of <clears throat> successful closures in subsistence. And that is is our primary focus here at Tanana Chiefs. Not sure if you wanted me to go on to more. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Amanda, for sharing that exciting, uh, very encouraging story. Uh, every effort that your program and uh, partnership that are helping you serve your relative to not only prepare for gainful employment, but to find their place in the community. It looks like um, you have seeing the program grow and under your leadership you are doing a lot of really good stuff so thank you again for sharing um are there any questions or comments for amanda before we move on to the next presenter there is a comment from rachel allen um, our consumers so we have had a few of our consumers um, who do bead work uh, we've helped them create a really nice brochure. Um, and this would have been prior to the whole Etsy, Facebook, um, uh, social media. It was a little bit before that time where we created a, a brochure. We photographed all of their um, items to sell and then created a booklet with an order form. And we did a, a mailing um, to the region we have had folks um, post photos on Fair Facebook Marketplace, but it's not something that we, you know, it's whatever they want to do. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely something we could probably um, expand on and, and remind them, but a lot of our, um, uh, especially the younger uh, generation has already picked up on social media and and put a lot of their photos and sell locally. <clears throat> um, they can come to our agency at any time and sell their, um, their beadwork. And then we also have Christmas bazaars. Um, let's see. Okay, there was a, a issue with the link that I put in there. So I'll try to get a better link. Okay. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing the resources that your program uses. Um, I want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. And with our weekly updates, um, a link to this recording will be sent out via email. <laughs> with that, uh, we will move on to our last presenter. Um, Mr. Lyle Cook, um, Director for the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Vocational Rehabilitation Program. Um, I had shared earlier that I have been to their tribal lands, um, so I have an idea how their particular program uh, is set up. Um, I have always been generously welcomed by the program staff in the community. So with that, um, let's move on to Lyle's story. Mr. Lyle Cook, please. I'm a doctor, not Kulayapi. Okay, Lyle, Himacha, Ikchewichash Himacha, now, Oyakiapi, Kolakichi, Wolitancha Himacha, 
So uh, I you like the, so I'm going to speak in my language, uh, the, the English language now. So I just uh, just said again, I'm Lyle Cook and I'm the current director of our uh, roughly translated into English means finds their place. I'm the current director of the program. So, I greet all of you today. So today I'm going to speak about the travel program. Um, first, I wanted to, you know, just give a little bit of background. I was hired on as a VR counselor back in 1996, fiscal year 96. So I think we started in 95 then. Um, then I transitioned to the director position in 2003. So I worked three years as a VR counselor and then I still had a yearning to work with our youth. So I left for about two and a half years to work with our youth because uh, I worked with uh, all aspects of our, our ages of our people. And uh, one day um, the former director, Carol Robinson, some of you know her, majority of you don't. Um, we bumped into each other. She said, are you ready to come back to work for Voc Rehab? And I said, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, within about uh, four or five months time, she, she moved on. So I don't know if she brought me back to be the director or what, but eventually I became the director of our travel Voc Rehab program. But in that time I uh, was gone, uh, we were on our second grant. So the topic of today are in, in the, the slide here. It says Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe O'un Iyakiapi, Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Carol, um, while she was the director, she met with our tribal leaders to describe what uh, vocational rehabilitation services were. So our, kid, our people could um, discuss it, our tribal elders could discuss it and help to uh, name it in our language, the Lakota language. And uh, so after, you know, she described all aspects of the, the program, they came up with O'u'i'ekiapi. And in our rough translation into English from our language, it's to find their place. Uh, a lot of our people, um, we've grown up, we're used to people saying, well, I'm diabetic, or you'll see somebody has a limb missing, or uh, they may have some kind of other physical limitation or uh, emotional, but they don't make that connection with our, our, our tribal way of life. So I was really uh, pleased with Carol's efforts when she came up with this O'u'i'ekiapi name. So we're gonna go into that later, but you see our, our um, tribal logo here. Um, There's seven uh, tribal bands, and but in our reservation, the Cheyenne River Sea Tribe, there's four of the bands, Minikoju, Iktajikjo, Sihasapa, Ohenupa. So the Minikoju is my mother's band. Iktajikjo is my band, that's my father's band. So I take my father's side. What I've learned over the years in visiting with many of our tribal directors is everybody has a certain way of how they connect to their bands within their own tribal nations. So that's a little bit about that. But the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe name uh, uh, was uh, given to us from the government. And uh, there's a river that runs through our uh, reservation. They call it the Cheyenne River. That's how we got our name. So many times when I go around and I say, uh, I'm the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe, it's, oh, you're Cheyenne. We're not Cheyenne. And uh, the Sioux is actually a derogatory term, uh, means snake in the grass. Uh, we don't have that word in our language, but yet because the government leave it us that way, it stays the Sioux tribe. But uh, actually it's a wakba washte oyanke, meaning uh, the good river people because we have three rivers that run through our reservation. And in, obviously you see 1868 on the flag. Uh, that's just when the, the federal government recognized us in their way, but we've been in existence like many of our people on the, the phone call today from all the tribal Alaska villages. We have, you know, we've been here um, for a long, long time. 
So that's a little bit about tribal flag. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So as I was sharing, um, Carol Robinson was the director. And uh, as, as I said, she, um, she came up with our program name, working with the elders. So you see that O Yakyapi Vocational Rehabilitation Services. And you, well, under that, the O Yakyapi in our language, the, the closest we could come to translate that in English was finds their place. But there's also other interpretations, but that's the one we settled on. Um, so I just kind of, uh, I'm very proud of that name. I, I know there's others out there in our tribal and uh, Alaska native um, programs. They've translated into their own language and I like that. Um, but today I'm talking about ours. So as you can see, um, we have the medicine wheel and the medicine wheel, some out there, um, they say it's related to the different nations. In our people, it was not related to the different nations. It's related to the directions. So the black, you see there's the, the line that goes out before it circles around. That's pointing to the west. And, uh, and that generally, it's like the sun too. If you look at the sun, it sets in the west. And then in the north, we have the color red. So that, that represents our north. Um, so usually in the morning for us, when we get up, uh, when the sun starts to come up, we'll see the red to the north. And then uh, it's like that and transitions to the east. So when the sun comes up in the east, you'll see the sun. So everything's kind of yellow at that time until about uh, mid noon, midday. Then when the sun's fully up, it gets white. So those, those represent our day and they go from, uh, how do you say counterclockwise or clockwise uh, that's kind of how we go. We always, uh, everything starts in the West when we pray and then so forth, North, East, South. Um, that's a little bit about the, the color arrangement. And then uh, we have the plume represents our women, our woman nation. So they, um, that, that's to represent our women. And of course, the, the eagle feather represents our men. So that's, that's um, how we put it in there. Uh, many times uh, over the years, I've uh, rearranged our logo to be more inclusive. And, you know, at some point, a couple of years, I may find something else and you may see some, you know, changes in that. But it's always interesting when I go to our conferences, I look at other tribal nations flags and their emblems. And uh, I, I try to visit to find out, you know, what, why is it that way? But if you notice, I, I see um, when I go out there, our colors, we call that the medicine wheel. I see other tribes have different colors in different areas and that's okay, that's their, that belongs to them. So for us, in my area, this is how we um, display our colors. And usually that center part, uh, that was something added on later. That's usually just open. There's nothing really in there. It's just the outside circle. But for, um, to help kind of people understand that, the, that who we work with, you know, uh, you see the emblem of the wheelchair. Uh, every time um, we would, uh, when you look at it, there's normally like four main um, icons out there to represent people. And that's these, these emblems. But the, the wheelchair usually had a, a male figure in there. That didn't sit right with me. So one of our um, staff, he's pretty good with the computer. And I asked him, I said, can you remove the, the male figure? Because it always looked like a male figure. I said, well, we're, you know, we have our male and our female and it, it just depends on how or what situation it, we're in uh, but so that's just a, a wheelchair but we know that it, you know male and female utilize those 
and then the next next one is the the brain the head with the brain uh, and it's dealing with uh, many types of issues but for that it's just kind of a one logo for a certain category and then obviously below that you have the hearing problems either death or hard of hearing and then the other one's the vision problem so that that's a little bit about the, the logo and how it came about but mainly the only yakyapi finds their place um, it, it just to, to help people understand you know for me as the director i've done my best over the years to reach out to our people that speak our language, uh, our elders, and those that still um, practice our, our way of life. So they really understand that because if you look at, uh, well, here in our area, most of our people with disabilities, um, they don't speak English too good either because they, they're, um, uh, they're raised in a, a family that still believes in our traditional values and our traditional way of life. So, but one thing like I shared earlier was that uh, our people, um, they don't make that connection with the word disability. That's an English language word. But only Yekyapi helps them to understand oh, I can find my place. So uh, I guess I'm burning up the clock here, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you for being asked to share this. And I really enjoyed the two presentations before, very informative. So with that, Lee, I'll turn it back to you. Right, thank you, Lyle. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, from the co-presenters and the information they shared about their tribal woke rehab practices is clearly evident that they have adapted um, and made efforts um, in a paradigm shift, if you will. <coughs> um, from looking at the standard federal, standard federal VR practices and from their own cultural lenses and perspective have designed their tribal vocational rehabilitation services that has an approach to a holistic traditional approach, um, addressing uh, the four components as we look at our tribal members with disability or tribal members in general. And that's looking at the mind, body, spirit, and emotion, and looking at the environment um, that we live in. I have learned a lot from the information shared by the co-presenters. And I thank you for allowing us to have a short but insightful glimpse into your tribal communities and how you are making sure that your tribal work rehab services are addressing the needs of your relatives, that you are listening to your consumers' relatives, that you are recognizing the importance of our traditional ways of practices, our beliefs, our value system, and more importantly, how we be with the world that we currently live in. I would like to thank the three co-presenters, the tribal work programs that are attending today's webinar by saying thank you for serving our relatives with disability in, in many ways than you could possibly recognize.